Hey guys, Will here. Welcome back to the channel. Now today I'm going to be showing you how to do some basic overclocking with an ASUS Prime Z390A motherboard. So we're going to be doing a little bit of overclocking with the i7-8700K processor tonight, which is the 8th generation processor. In a couple of days time I'm hoping to get my hands on a 9th generation processor as well to do some testing and overclocking with as well. But what I'm going to do tonight is take you through all the basic settings that I've used to overclock this 8700K, very similar to my Z370 motherboard video that I did a couple of months back again now. So it's going to be a pretty top level overclocking video guide. I'm going to show you the settings that I've used, give you a basic explanation of what some of the settings do that we're going to be tweaking in here. Now I want to mention straight up that I am working on another video series at the moment where I go through all of the details and fundamentals of overclocking in great detail. Now I've shot the first couple of videos now and I know that the guys that have seen the previous video would know that it's been a long time coming, but I am working on it at the moment. I'm hoping to get the first few videos out within the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned for those ones. Definitely subscribe to the channel so you don't miss those ones as well but let's get stuck into the Z390A motherboard so we'll start off by hitting F7 to get out of the basic menu and into the advanced menu now we don't need to worry about my favorites or main we're going to go straight across to AI tweaker here now what I like to do for basic overclocking is use the XMP profiles for the RAM now we've got 3600 megahertz RAM installed in this machine with CAS latency 17 so you can see here I've got the XMP profile loaded for that RAM. Now you might only have one profile here depending on the memory that you've got, but I've got XMP2 loaded. Then we scroll down, we make sure that it looks like it's the correct speed for our RAM. So have a look on your packet. It should say the megahertz that it is and also the latency as well. So the first number that you see there after the 3603, so the 17, that's the CAS latency. And then the 18, 18, 39 and so forth is the um, secondary timings there as well. So we don't need to worry about those at this stage. What we can do later on through the video series is actually go in and show you how to do some memory overclocking as well. But generally what I recommend is if people are just trying to get a nice easy overclock, just use the XMP profile. You really don't see a massive difference in performance between XMP and fine tune overclocking of RAM anyway. So we'll keep on going down. The B clock frequency should be 100. Now this is the clock frequency that the motherboard operates independently of the CPU. So this also controls a couple of other front side bus things as well like you know various different controllers on the motherboard PCI Express and things like that ASUS multi-core enhancement now this I like to disable basically what this setting does is it allows the motherboard to detect what the CPU is and then apply some changes based on that CPU to give you the best performance now the reason I don't like using this is because it tends to give us way over the top voltages that generate a lot of unnecessary heat and can also introduce a lot of instability so we'll leave that disabled SVID behavior, you can really leave this set on whatever you want because it's not going to make any difference once we set our SVID setting below. Now what this setting actually means is that every single CPU has what's called an SVID table and that tells the motherboard exactly what voltages that CPU should require at various different clock speeds. So what this setting does is it will say, all right, if the CPU is at this frequency, I should use this voltage on the V core. So there's a couple of different scenarios that we can have here based on those CPUs. So we can have Intel's failsafe, which is the exact values that come straight out of that table and then ASUS actually provides some overrides for that as well so worst case scenario basically means you've got a crappy processor and you need to increase the voltages typical scenario should work for most people and then best case scenario is if you've got a golden chip so I'm just gonna leave that on typical scenario for now AVX instruction core negative offset now I like to set this to zero basically AVX instruction sets put a lot of additional load and generate a lot of additional heat on the CPU so sometimes if you're working at the very top end of your overclock, you might need to set this at a negative offset of say maybe two or three. What that'll mean is that under non-AVX instructions, the CPU will be running at the maximum clock speed that we define a little later on. If we have an AVX offset, what will happen is the CPU will ring down based off that offset. So say we're starting off with five gigahertz. When we get an AVX instruction, what will happen is it'll offset the amount that we put here. So say if we put a offset of two, the CPU would go from 5 gigahertz down to 4.8 gigahertz when we're under AVX load. And as soon as that AVX load comes off, the CPU bounces straight back up to 5 gigahertz again. So we're going to leave that as zero to start off with. Now we go down to CPU core ratio. So what I like to do here is sync all the cores together. So what that means is that all of our cores are going to be locked in together at the same frequency. So set that to 50 for 5 gigahertz. We're going to start off with 5 gigahertz with this 8700K. And then we can work our way up or down from there depending on how we go with it. So B clock frequency you can just leave on automatic. 
Odd RAM ratio we can enable. We don't really need to worry about that setting too much. DRAM frequency, that should have been preset by the XMP profile, but if it's not, you can adjust this to be the correct frequency for your RAM. Now we don't want to load in the five gigahertz overclocking profile for this CPU because as I mentioned before with the SVID setting, ASUS tends to push the voltages really, really high when you use their built-in profile. So we're going to skip over that. CPU SVID support. So this is what we were talking about earlier where the motherboard can actually read the values that the CPU is commanding. We're going to leave that disabled because we're going to be manually overriding those settings. DRAM timing control, if we jump into that quickly, we'll see here that it's preloaded directly from our XMP profile. So we don't need to touch that for now. Digi VRM. So this is where things start to get a little bit more complicated. So I like to set my load line calibration to begin with at level six. So load line calibration is something that we're going to go into a lot more detail in our overclocking fundamentals course. But basically what this allows the motherboard to do is compensate for the massive variations in the amount of current draw that it sees between idle and load. So typically when a CPU goes from idle to load, it suddenly starts drawing a massive amount of power. And what happens is the capacitors in the motherboard become discharged and the voltage will drop a little bit. And that can introduce instability into the system. So basically increasing the setting here primes the motherboard so that it's ready for that additional load. So what you'll actually see with a level six load line calibration is that the CPU V core actually goes up slightly under load. And that's okay when we're doing basic overclocking like this. Now, when we get into the really, really fine tuning, often we'll find that we can actually lower this down to maybe a level five. And what that'll mean is that the CPU voltage might drop off just slightly. Now, the idea here is to try and stabilize the voltage as much as possible between idle and load. But what we don't see when we're measuring voltages in our CPU Z software and things like that is the spikes that we get when we're coming off and on load because the sample rate is quite low with these motherboards. So what will happen typically is if you're suddenly going from idle to load, the voltage can actually shoot up really high, almost dangerously high under that scenario, but you don't actually see that in your monitoring software. So a lot of people like to run a lower load line calibration because of that, but for basic overclocking, I think level six is a good place to start. And then we can lower it down to level five or maybe even level four once we get a stable overclock. But we'll cover that in a lot more detail in our load line calibration video. So set that to level six for now. Synchronize AC-DC load line with VRM load line. We can leave that disabled for now because we're not going to be doing really hardcore overclocking here. So next we have CPU current capability. Now I just set this to the maximum. What that does is it stops the motherboard from scaling back the performance when we go over the amount of current that it thinks we should be able to. So obviously you're gonna need some pretty decent cooling to do this. If you start to see your temperatures go too high, so over about 90 degrees, we wanna back things off a little bit anyway, but set that to 170. VRM switching frequency, we don't need to worry about this setting at the moment because we're not getting into our fine tuning just yet. If you're finding that you've reached the maximum stable overclock and you want to try and push a little bit more, we can actually set this to manual and then change our switching frequency here. Now, there's a bit of a trade-off here. The higher we set our switching frequency, the more quickly the motherboard can respond to transient loads at the trade-off of additional heat. So I normally just leave this set to automatic to begin with. And then if I'm fine tuning later on, I can set it to manual. VRM spread spectrum, again, we can enable that if we need to, but generally I'll leave it disabled. All that does is it just gives us a little bit of additional filtering on the motherboard that sometimes give us a little bit more stability. CPU duty control, what I do here is I leave that to T-probe, which means that it's controlled by the temperature of the motherboard. If we set it to extreme, it basically means that the VRMs are running at maximum capability all the time, but we don't need to do that for basic overclocking. So leave that on T-probe. CPU power phase control. Again here, leave that on automatic for now. We can always set it to extreme later on if we want to try and squeeze a little bit more out of our CPU once we've got an idea of what sort of temperatures we're getting. VRM thermal control, again, same, same deal. Leave it on auto for now. We can set it to enabled later on if we need to, but generally I think it's enabled by default anyway. CPU graphics load line calibration and CPU current capability, leave these on automatic as well, particularly if you're using the integrated graphics built into your CPU. If you're not using these, what we will do later on is disable the iGPU anyway, and that can sometimes give us a little bit of additional overclocking headroom as well, provided that you've got a graphics card that you're using. So we'll keep going down, graphics switching frequency, leave that on auto as well. Now all of these boot voltages that we see down here, we can leave all of these set on automatic and the motherboard will just control these at initial boot up before it loads up our profile. So those can all stay automatic. So jumping down to internal CPU management, I usually disable my Intel speed step because I want the CPU to run at its maximum frequency all the time. 
it's just a bit of a debatable topic here and we will cover this in more detail in a later video but generally speaking the amount of power drain difference in terms of how much it costs you between running your CPU maximum all the time and only ramping the frequency up when it's actually under load is very 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 small so I prefer the CPU to just run at its maximum all the time so but this is really a personal preference thing it probably won't make a whole lot of difference to the overclock I just like to leave that disabled and we will cover that in a lot more detail later on in the video series turbo mode leave that enabled now long duration power package limit we want to set this to the absolute maximum here so just type in 99999 and it will jump back to 4096. What that's essentially doing is telling the motherboard not to reduce the amount of power that's available based on the duration of the load so we leave that at maximum package power time window we set that to maximum as well so again 999 and it will jump to 127 and again short duration package power limit we set that to the maximum as well everything else here we can leave on automatic for now IAAC and IADC load line calibrations we would need to set if we were doing adaptive voltage but as you'll see in a minute we're going to set our voltages in manual mode so everything else here can be left alone scroll down to tweak as paradise we really don't need to touch anything in here everything is fine on automatic for a basic overclock once you get into fine tuning you might end up adjusting some things in here but we can cover that in a later video as well AI features, again in the majority of cases I leave all this set on automatic because the motherboard does a pretty good job of controlling these things on its own. So now we move down to our CPU core and cache current limit. Again set this to the maximum for the same reason as before, so 99999 and it will jump to 25575. Automatic and automatic are okay for our CPU graphics current limit. Ring down bin leave set on automatic as well, the motherboard can do a perfectly fine job of controlling that. Now CPU's maximum CPU cache and minimum CPU cache, I generally leave these set on automatic to begin with. If I'm finding that I've got a little bit of instability, I can adjust these later on. So generally I try to aim to have these set about 300 megahertz lower than our maximum clock speed. So if we scroll back up to our core ratio, you can see here it is set to 50, which is five gigahertz. So we would ideally want these to be around sort of 46, 47. Now going too high can introduce a little bit of instability and there really isn't a whole lot of benefit to running these much higher than sort of 42, 43 anyway, but I generally find 46, 47 is okay. If you're having problems, you can lower these down. But again, I'm gonna leave these on automatic for now. You'll find for most people, automatic does a perfectly fine job of controlling these. CPU graphics ratio again leave this set on automatic unless you're having problems now we scroll down to our voltages so B clock aware adaptive voltage I like to leave this disabled CPU cache voltage now this is where it's going to be a little bit of trial and error with your particular CPU and it will depend on the type of CPU that you're running as well and you want to keep your voltage somewhere in between the sort of 1.25 to 1.35 range unless you've got really really good cooling even for my really high-end cooling that I've got in my PC that you would have seen in my other videos I still like to keep it around the sort of 1.35 volt range for daily use. So we're going to set that to 1.29, which should be stable for 5 gigahertz on an 8700K for most people. DRAM voltage again is controlled by the XMP profile for the RAM, so it should be around the sort of 1.35 volts range. Now CPU VCC IO voltage, I can get away with my CPU running this at 1.0 volts. Some people will find they might need up to about 1.2 volts. Now this is where the voltages get a little bit crazy with ASUS's built-in profiles. I've seen this go up to almost 1.4 volts, which is absolutely ridiculous. For most people, 1.1, 1.2 volts is fine. So I'd say start off with 1.1. If everything's stable, then you can go down to 1.0. And if that introduces instability, then go back to 1.1 or maybe even raise it up higher again. But the important thing here is to not change more than one setting at a time when you're doing stability testing because that way you don't know what's fixed the problem or introduced instability. So 1.1 volts should be a pretty good starting point. We don't want to introduce any additional heat unnecessarily. CPU system agent voltage as well, 1.1. So VCC IO is actually the memory controller voltage which is built into the CPU on these chips. The system agent voltage controls the voltage of other components on the motherboard. So we can leave that at 1.1 as well. CPU graphics voltage will leave on automatic because we're not going to be overclocking the built-in graphics and that should be just fine. PCH core voltage and everything from here below you can just leave on automatic. Basically unless you're using exotic cooling like phase change and stuff like that you really don't need to touch these. So then we move across to our advanced tab. CPU configuration here. What I like to do is scroll down to the bottom here. All of these settings can stay as they are. CPU power management control. I like to disable speed step, disable speed shift technology as well so that we don't get the CPU cranking down when it's not under load as I discussed earlier. CPU C states are disabled as well for the same reason. 
And that is pretty much it for basic overclocking on a Z390 motherboard. So you're also obviously going to want to set up your fan profiles as well for PWM control. I have a separate video which I'll link above my head for you now where I explained all of that in great detail. So once you're done with all of that, go across to tool and scroll down to ASUS user profile. And you just want to save this as a profile so that you can come back to it later on. So we'll just set a profile name as 5.0 gigahertz. Whoops, gigahertz. And then save to profile one save to profile and then we go across and we go to save changes and reset and if everything goes well the PC should boot into Windows and you can run your stability test now I do also have another video which I linked above my head for you right now showing how I stability test a PC so we'll just have a real quick look here at our settings in CPU Z make sure that we're happy with how everything is sitting obviously we've booted into Windows successfully here so CPU Z is up and we can see here we're running at a locked frequency of 5 gigahertz and our CPU voltage is 1.288 volts. So we set it at 1.3, and as I mentioned before, it will vary a little bit depending on the motherboard. Obviously, higher quality motherboards are a little bit more stable on the voltage, but 1.288 volts is perfectly stable for idle. And what we should find is when we place it under load, that voltage should actually go up slightly. Now, one thing that I have noticed with OCCT on this particular motherboard is that my voltages aren't actually being reported accurately and that goes to show how important it is to make sure that you set things very accurately don't trust one piece of software to always tell you the exact right values here so we'll start a quick test here we can see here our temperatures are all within an acceptable range we'll jump back across to CPU Z as well we can see here our voltage is 1.305 volts under load if we come back off load again we should see that drop back down to, and you can see it's dropped back down to 1.288 volts so i'm perfectly happy with that we can see our frequency is stable at 5 gigahertz so what i would do is i'd run this for about an hour see if we have any problems if we do i'd jump back into the bios again i'd raise my v core voltage just slightly so maybe by 0.01 See if that makes it stable. Keep going up in 0.01 increments until you find the point that it's stable. Bearing in mind that you want to keep your maximum temperatures under 90 degrees. So if you start to reach the point where you're reaching 90 degrees on your cores, you're reaching the maximum voltage which you're able to safely run with your particular setup. So as you increase your voltage, your temperature will also increase. If you've reached a point where your CPU is still not stable and you're getting up towards that 90 degree range, what you'll need to do is reduce your core frequency by one. So we go down to say 49, which would be 4.9 gigahertz, and then lower our voltage back down to 1.3 again. And if it's stable at that point, then we continue to lower our voltage until we reach the point where it becomes unstable. And then we go back up by 0.01 again until it's stable. So that is basically how I stabilize a overclock for this motherboard. And again, guys, I do cover this in a lot more detail in my stability testing guide. So guys, that is it for my quick Z390A overclocking guide. I hope this helps you guys get your overclocks nice and stable. Obviously, we can do a lot of fine tuning from here as well, but that's beyond the scope of this video. I think this should cover most people and it should give you a basic idea of the settings that you should use to get started with. So if you are interested in more information, let me know in the comments below. Let me know if there's anything specific that you would like help with. Remember, we also do have a Discord channel which I've linked in the description below where I can help you out with some more fine tuning as well. And of course, stay tuned for our overclocking fundamentals videos coming up soon. But that's it for this video, guys. Hit the like button if you found it helpful. Hit the subscribe button as well so you don't miss the next video and of course the notification bell and I will see you in the next one. Bye.